So, um, first I would like to talk about self-motion illusions, what they are. Um, then why would they be interesting and relevant? Um, what specific research questions I tackled, um, how I did it, what I found, and uh, just conclude and, and uh, point out what I'm interested uh, in doing in the future. So first, self-motion illusions, what is it? Well, as the, the name kind of hints, it's the illusion of self-motion, uh, the perception of self-motion. So you are, uh, for example, uh, um, looking at a waterfall like this, or you're looking over a bridge down on the water, and at first the water looks like it's flowing underneath you, right? the water is moving. But over time, slowly you perceive that the water isn't moving anymore, rather you are moving the opposite direction of the water. So there is a point when you perceive as physically moving, even though you're not physically moving. Uh, that phenomenon has been used for uh, entertainment, theme park rides, and so on. And there is an early example uh, um, of the haunted swing in the San Francisco Midwinter Fair of uh, 1895. And uh, Wood was a spectator who experienced this, quote, ride. And, uh, and it was basically a swing that was mounted in a room. So the swing wasn't really moving. Rather, the room around the swing was tumbling. And the swing had a, a, something mounted to it that could vibrate it a little bit to give kind of the, the sensation of moving, but really people were not, not moving at all. So they were seated there, and the room started to tumble around it, and participants felt like they were actually swinging on that swing. They were actually going around. And that sensation was so intense that uh, they felt dizziness, sickness, and some of them even fainted. So how can that be? You are not really moving, yet you show all the behavioral signs of actually intensely moving. So that's quite intriguing. It was very intriguing to me. I thought this would be great if we could somehow use that. So how could we use that? Um, well, we could use it in, in several ways. One would be, and this is supposed to be a big brain, there's a background to all these words. We could use it to um, find out how we perceive ourselves moving. In the previous example, you could see that uh, people experienced self-motion merely by looking at something. So they were not really moving. Because when you move, you, you get vestibular cues from your balance organs, you, get, you hear how the environment passes by, you see. But in this instance, vision alone was sufficient to induce a sensation of motion, so we could investigate self-motion by disambiguating senses. Like we could just look at vision and say, how can we, uh, what parameters, for example, are important for us to, to elicit a sensation of, of motion. But besides, I mean, we could also look uh, for how uh, various um, uh, senses are interacting with each other. So for example, how uh, does vision and hearing interact with each other? So we can study them more systematically in a separate, separate environment, right? Um, so that, that is more like the theory, like, okay, let's look how we actually take and how we work. And, but there's also a practical aspect. Um, how can we get a more convincing sensation of motion in environments where we need it, but we are not really moving? For example, in, in, in virtual reality, in computer games, in maybe cinemas, theme park rides, and so on, how can we give people a convincing sensation of motion when they're not moving? For example, uh, uh, driving simulators. You see these, up, up there the two pictures, where you can see a motion platform underneath the cabin where participants are seated. So these, these devices are designed to move participants around in, the, in, 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 this, in this vehicle or in these cabins, and the motion is, is usually um, congruent with what they see on the screen with what they hear. But these devices are quite costly to implement, and they're quite often custom made. So how could we get away with less? How could we still give people the sensation of moving without these costly uh, motion platform devices that are you know, effortful and, and to implement and needs uh, trained and skilled people to do so? So, and this is why I'm interested in, in, in vaccine, because I think there's a great potential for that. So how do I, what do I address within the field of vaccine? So there are various components of this study, various questions that, I'm, that, that I'd like to ask. The first question relates to the trajectory that participants experience within a virtual environment. So you can have, you can experience locomotion that goes on a straight path, straight ahead. You can experience turns. You can experience turning in place. So there are various types of motion profiles that you can experience. And Trudeau et al. in 2009 found that, just confirmed various previous studies, 
that uh, it is helpful uh, that you um, employ um, uh, curvatures that are more narrow, so you have higher turn velocity, versus just going straight. And their recommendation is that uh, whenever you'd like to elicit um, a convincing sensation of self-motion, vection, uh, you should use turned uh, uh, turns, curvatures, instead of just using straight paths. So they used a uh, they used optic flow and a natural environment to come to test it. So there are various ways various ways you can visually elicit motion. One is just using a say a photorealistic rendering of the world, like a city or a building, or you can use you can just extract some motion information from a natural scene and just use pure motion information that would be sufficient to give you the sensation of motion. And that's optic flow. It's an abstract pattern of sorts that is moving, that is radially expanding, for example, as you were supposed to be moving through the environment. So, so I'm interested in, does that, does that still hold true under optic flow when you use, for example, uh, a more contemporary uh, setup with stereo vision and head tracking? So if, if that would hold true, then you could say, OK, in the context of, say, a home, home gaming setup, which includes a 3D TV and a uh, PlayStation or whatever, uh, would that still go true? Would we still prefer turns over straight paths when we design these games or design these simulators? Then the second um, research question is, um, do small physical motion cues help us perceive self-motion, like infection in this, in this case? So Bernard Rieke found in 2006 that when you use a little wheel, a wheelchair, and you use the wheelchair to control your motion through virtual reality, that helps you to, it, it helps you in terms of the, the intensity of the motion that you experience, and the experience of the motion starts earlier than when you, for example, just use a keyboard or a mouse to control velocity through the virtual environment. So, the, so for me, the question was, well, if it works for a wheelchair, like, like that one, would it also work for something that is more commercially available that you don't have to necessarily modify? Like a gaming chair is something uh, that has been becoming more and more popular. It's been out for this particular one for about four years or something, for three, four years. So if I could spend, say, $200 on a gaming chair, put it in my living room, put it in front of my 3D TV, does it really help? Do I have to build a special device in order to, to, give, to provide these motion? So we're looking into motion cueing, physical, small physical motion cueing and their effects on, uh, on vection. And the third question uh, relates to how we interact, how we control locomotion in virtual reality. So oftentimes in infection studies, participants are seated on a chair. Um, they are watching a motion stimulus, and after a certain time, they perceive action. So in some other studies, not, not that many though, uh, they are actually actively controlling their own. I'm interested in how do these two conditions compare in one study, because it's diff difficult to compare those. They're different motion stimuli, they're different participants, different setups. So in one study, systematically, does interactivity benefit vection? What, does it help vection at all? It, it's relevant because many um, installations use um, active, inter active locomotion control in gaming and, and motion simulators. We are actively controlling our vehicle or uh, airplane or whatever. So, so um, this is the question number three that I'd like to address. And then the last question is, we're already having participants on the setup. We're already uh, comparing various uh, conditions. So we would like to know how this gaming chair that we're using, how do participants feel about it? So the claim of the manufacturer is, well, this is a more embodied uh, uh, interaction paradigm. It's supposed to be uh, more engaging. It's supposed to substitute uh, a traditional joystick or a traditional interface device. It's kind of the new, the new way of how we can experience virtual reality or computer games. And so I was thinking, is this really true? Like, you know, how, how does this compare to something as traditional as a joystick for gaming? It's been around for, I don't know, 20 years. So, so just, a, just a comparison. How I go about in investigating this is I take participants and I place them on a, uh, on a uh, motion simulator that, that I built a vection simulator. Now that doesn't have any, any, any uh, actuators or anything like that. It's just a plain platform on which a gaming chair is mounted. Participants are seated on it and they're looking at a projection screen with 3D glasses. And their head motion is tracked so it adjusts the viewpoint dynamically uh, and the perspective. 
and then we have two conditions. We say, okay, so now you're, you're here in this virtual reality. Uh, you will experience either passive locomotion, so there's a passive locomotion block in which participants are not controlling their locomotion actively using any interface device. They're just traditionally sitting there uh, and exposed to the motion stimulus. And in the second condition, they're actively controlling. They're actively controlling their, uh, uh, their locomotion through VR. And for each of those two blocks, we have two conditions. One, either they're experiencing motion cues, uh, or they experience no motion cues. Like we talked about the, the wheelchair, how it would uh, afford vection, so we're, trying to, we're, we're comparing those two. And then, and then for, each of, uh, for each of these individual no motion or motion conditions, we have uh, three of these path conditions, 0, uh, 8, and 24 degrees. So we are investigating how does path curvature affect the action. There, is a, there are um, two videos I'd like to show you. And they just show how, um, how it looks like when participants interact with the, uh, the virtual reality. So that is a participant, and this is a condition in which they do not move and do not control the motion. So they're passively watching the scenes. So this is the passive no motion condition. Now, alternatively, they would use the um, joystick. They would not move, and they would just use the joystick in the active uh, no motion condition. So, and the, the second video is the video where participants are actively controlling their locomotion, but also they experience physical motion cues. So in this instance, the participant is using this chair to lean into the, direct, uh, into the desired direction. And so based on the degree of the deflection, the, the faster they go, the, the higher, they, the more they lean. So, it's, it's the, so the leaning is basically controlling the velocity. And uh, there are two conditions. Either in this case, they're just uh, actively they're actively locomoting, and in the in the passive condition, I'm actually standing behind them, and there's a handle there, and I'm kind of, I'm, I'm moving them in the chair. So the chair is like a joystick, but either they are using the, this chair actively, or I'm pushing them on passive. So out of this study, we found that we could confirm that yes, based this is in line with previous work higher turn velocities do affect vection in that when you have higher turn velocities, participants feel um, they feel vection earlier, they, are, they feel that the magnitude of vection is more intense, and the likelihood that they experience vection is higher. So in this instance, so the first slide uh, refers to the vection latency, which is the time that it takes for participants to perceive vection. And you will, and the second graph is the vection intensity is the magnitude of the experience, how intense was the sensation of motion. And the third one is the occurrence of vection. Now you can see that there's experiment one and experiment two. Experiment one is just a training phase that we had participants go through to get familiar with the setup. And we were interested in just showing them how to navigate through the world using the chair and the joystick. So they just get familiar with the overall procedure. So we skipped the zero degree con condition because it is just a straight path. And we were saying, well, straight path, you know, you don't really have to, to train much to go on a straight path. But you do for turns. It's, you know, you have to, to use the interface to control it. So this is why you see for experiment one, which is the light gray one over there, that um, uh, there's no, no data for zero degrees. But overall, you can see the trend. So, so for higher turn, turn velocities, you can see that vection latency goes down. We weren't sensitive enough to detect any differences between 0 and 8 degrees, possibly because there was just not enough difference. And our measures may have been that we couldn't detect that. The uh, vection intensity, you can see it's pretty clear. Uh, the, more, uh, the higher the turn velocity, the greater the magnitude of the experienced uh, motion. And here you can see the um, uh, likelihood that participants perceive vection is increasing with increasing turn angle, although we could only find this difference between 0 and 24, which means for greater differences, it becomes more obvious. Can, can I interrupt with sure. a question? Uh, um, yeah, sure. What is 0 degrees? That means stationary visual stimulus? Uh, 0 degrees means a straight path. So that, that refers to the turn, the turn velocity. Okay. So that is the, that's the rotational component of a curvilinear uh, trajectory. So were they reporting vection, linear vection in the straight path condition? In the straight path condition, they, uh, they do report vection. But the, the amount, the magnitude of the experience varies, depends. It, it's, it's stronger for a, for a curved trajectory than it is for the straight trajectory. 
Uh, so that's between the zero degrees of rotation and the eight degrees per second rotation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Did not have any effect on their uh, on on the infections. The reports of infection. Yeah, the, re the, 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 the report. report. Yeah. When we went up to uh, 24 degrees at the second time. Huh? Yeah. yeah. There's a, there's a greater gap too between zero uh, between eight and twenty four and zero and eight. Uh, it's, yeah. It's, it's yeah. So that that could be this big this bigger difference. Okay, cool. So uh, question number two, which is the physical motion curing with the chair. Uh, we we found that the trend is 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 similar to what people described before. Yes. Uh, the physical motion cueing helps in, in, in the in the vection experience. Participants generally feel more uh, a greater magnitude of motion of vection when they are uh, in the motion condition versus the no motion condition. That means when I move them on the chair or when they are moving in the chair has a, has a greater effect on them. They feel more uh, they feel a stronger sensation of motion versus just sitting there and ex exposed to the motion stimulus. We couldn't find, though, a significant difference for affection onset, like latency, so the time it takes from the, uh, for the participant uh, between the, on the beginning of the stimulus to experience motion, and affection occurrence. Interactivity uh, was, an interesting, that was interesting because uh, we assumed that we found, we thought that, infection inter uh, that um, interactivity would help affection for various reasons uh, outlined in the paper. But we found that interactivity can be uh, can strain participants a little bit if they had to get used to the interface device. We found that it took them longer to experience vection when they were actively controlling locomotion uh, versus when they were uh, just passively experiencing the motion stimulus. So something happened between just sitting there, following the motion, and using a joystick or the chair to, to navigate through the world. It, it, it takes them longer to perceive vection. Vection intensity and vection occurrence were not affected, just vection latency. So we're qu the question is, what, what could be the reason for that? And this, uh, this uh, plot depicts um, a, the vection latency between interface devices, the joystick and the chair, for each experiment. So, we, so let's look at experiment one first, which is the training, the training phase. This is the light, the gray, the gray one. Not the black one, the gray one. And you can see that if, during experiment one, during the training phase, basically, participants, uh, uh, it took generally longer for the, active, and for the active condition. They took generally longer for experiment two as well. And no matter what interface device they used, they always took longer to perceive action when they were actively using, uh, uh, when they actively controlling locomotion. But in experiment one, you can see there is a difference between the chair and the joystick, the chair is the dash line. So it, take, it took participants significantly longer uh, to perceive action when they were using the chair to control locomotion uh, compared to when they were using the joystick. When they were using the joystick, you can see that curve is, is flatter, the slope. And in experiment two, after they had some time to familiarize themselves with, uh, with the, the setup of their interface devices, you can see how overall the latency is lower for both the chair and the joystick. Um, uh, but yet still, it's higher for the active condition. But you can see how the chair and the joystick are becoming closer. They're, 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 they're getting more similar. And, 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 and we think that it could be because participants know how, possibly know how to use a joystick, or the joystick is more intuitive, but the chair is, is more difficult to use. So it takes some time for them to get used to the chair. But over time, these two devices become more and more alike in terms of controlling <coughs> It seems there's a training, some sort of a training and an initial difficulty with these So the question is, well, the chair, the joystick, which one would we prefer? Which one did participants like more uh, in terms of the intu in terms of intuitivism, in terms of the, uh, the precision of using the device? Uh, and generally, participants rated the, they, that they would prefer the joystick in terms of the intu in intuitiveness and in terms of its precision. Precision in terms of how how easy is it for me to follow uh, the motion trajectory? How easy is it for me to control that motion? How precise does the chair or the joystick respond to what I want it to do? And intuition is, 
Well, it's pretty clear how I can use it. I know how I use it. There's no questions. I just want to grab it and I'll, I'll move it forward. It goes forward. So um, overall, the chair wasn't rated that high, but that most likely people have never seen a chair before. So, uh, so for them, it was a new thing. I had a open question, a questioning session after the experiment, after the training and the second experiment, and I asked them, what did you think about using this chair? Just generally, what do you think? How did it feel like? So I didn't really know what to expect. So what happened at the end of the interview, I looked over uh, the, the responses, and I identified certain, uh, certain themes or categories that people responded to. So, uh, so for example, that people mentioned. For example, uh, there, there was mentioning of, well, I experienced there was a lack of control. I experienced uh, some pain or something related to the chip wasn't very ergonomical. So if I found that the motion was distracting. So I identified these categories, and so I, those are the categories around that radar chart. And then for each of these categories, I counted how often did a response fall, fall into this category. So sometimes there were, uh, for example, let's say five or six participants said, well, I found the chair was really engaging. So I said, OK, engagement, six, or whatever the number was. So those are the, the numbers here on the radar chart 0 to 15. It's the frequency of the, of, of the response that fell into the category. So overall, you can see by the shaded area that, uh, that the ch using the chair leads towards uh, engagement. People felt like m they felt more they're there, they're in, in the engaged in the virtual environment. Uh, they also felt there was a lack of control. So they didn't feel very confident when they used the chair that they could fulfill the, the mission goal to, to travel through following this green cube. And also, um, there are some participants who complained about motion sickness. They said the chair motion is upsetting me. I got dizzy, I got you know, headache and all day. So, so basically, to ask the question uh, whether or not a chair is useful, we would say, well, it depends. If you like to explore space, it doesn't matter how precise you are, you know, go for the chair. You can just enjoy it, go and, and, and travel through space and look at various things and don't worry about how exactly, you know, the precision is not that important. But if you have a very specific task, you would like the person to go from point A to point B and they have to follow a very narrow line or just, it's gaming, for example, you have to be very precise about your, your motions that you prefer to join. So in conclusions, um, Briefly, well, we found uh, in line with the study of Tortoyo that, yes, increasing turn velocities facilitate vection. So whenever, even under contemporary viewing conditions, if you'd like to uh, elicit vection, it is better to use curved trajectories or try to stick with uh, curved trajectories rather than just straight paths. Second, yes, simple motion cueing can be beneficial. Uh, and it seems that it can be quite easily implemented and quite uh, cheaply as well. When it comes to interactivity, um, we need to be careful when we select the interface device. There is an initial training phase, we have to be aware of that. But uh, also, what interface device we select may affect vection. So we've seen that there is that participants take longer when they, use, uh, when they, when they uh, actively control the chair, which also has the chair motions in it. And so, um, so we just have to look for um, other interface devices, possibly, to, um, to see what effect that has on the action. And the joystick, uh, well, as mentioned earlier, it, it's the preferred choice if you are looking for something that people can just pick up and from precisely control motion. Um, <clears throat> there are a few questions that arose from the study that I'm personally interested in pursuing. Um, the first questions relate to the, the, the locomotion paradigm, using the chair or using something to control locomotion through the arm. We had complaints with this chair that um, during the experiment, sometimes it stuck. It didn't move freely. So that's a problem, right? You were seeing the motions, and now this chair stuck. So, so there, uh, uh, there, there was lots of problems with the quality, the plastics, and so on that were used. And they became some screws came loose, and so on. So, so um, I would like to revisit this particular paradigm, but with a quality device or with a homemade device that, that work, may work better, just to see this. This tilting paradigm, this leaning paradigm, generally works well. Uh, and I um, would like to investigate alternative paradigms, like for example, this swapper chair up there. I don't know if you can see it, John. It's on the top right. It's a person who sits on a on, on a chair. It's called the swapper. You can lean with it. You can you can turn on it in place, and so you can control your locomotion. But you, you also use 
a separate interface device like a gun to do the precision, to do you know shooting. So how can how, what what principles work in terms of, of, of motion cueing? It's all about investigating these principles. As the second question related to interactivity. So first, um, how does the usability of the interface device affect vection? I'd like to systematically investigate uh, to what degree the usability, the precision, the difficulty of the device affects vection. And, um, and play around with different interface devices again. Um, and the use of physiological layers. Um, so basically we ask participants to indicate when they experienced vection and how the vection ex experience was. Now, when they were controlling the, uh, the chair, for example, they may have just been a little bit too distracted. They may say, well, okay, I, now I feel infection, but actually I felt it earlier. So we don't know. Was it due to the fact that they were really experiencing infection later, or was it because they just failed to report it in a timely manner? So uh, it would be great to, to corroborate our um, quantitative uh, findings with some uh, data, with some sort of a uh, EEG, like uh, this, this device over there, um, to just measure if there's anything neurological happening that we can pick up on and just uh, augment our data. And the last point is, is, is an important point, it's motion sickness. So in virtual reality, uh, in, in training simulators, and especially in the field of action, motion sickness is a big problem. And people try to find ways to mitigate motion sickness because it's distracting. Um, Donald and Luba found that when you, when you actively control your locomotion, motion sickness can be mitigated. He says, why does the driver rarely get motion sick? That's an interesting point. So I like to, to systematically investigate motion sickness to find out how levels of interactivity affect motion sickness. This work, wouldn't, I wouldn't be here, this work wouldn't be here if, uh, if I had not um, the friendship and the support of uh, Bernard and yeah, Diane and, and John and all the colleagues from the lab. I, I do appreciate your time and the, the resources that you have that have given me to to get to the next step in my life. So I do appreciate your being here and um, your help. So thank you very much. <laughs>